Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to look out and see you. It's great to look into the camera and see all of you that are joining us online. I see you. You see me? Uh, well, it is the last day of the Iowa State Fair. How many of you got, how many of you been to the fair? How many are going to get a last visit to the fair today? All right, there's a few of you. It's a uh, it's going to warm back up. We've had a couple of really nice days, and uh, it is summer, and it is, it is hot in Iowa, and uh, we've, we, uh, we love the fair. I just want to say thanks to all of you who helped at the fair working at the Cattlemen's Quarters serving breakfast, and uh, that is all that money goes to speed the light to missions, and we're thankful for what that can do. So not only is it the last day of the Iowa State Fair, it's the last weekend before the start of the school year for most all of you. How many of you are excited about that. If you've got children in school, it's always exciting at the beginning of the summer to start a new routine, but uh, having gone through this for a lot of years, uh, our youngest is a senior this year, so it's our last big hurrah of high school, um, but uh, always nice to get back into that uh, routine of the school year. So all of our families are saying, yes, this is, this is exciting. Well, we are continuing in our series in Peter. And so um, we've been looking at these two letters that Peter wrote near the end of the New Testament. If you want to turn to uh, the book of Second Peter, we're looking at Second Peter chapter 2 today. Peter uh, is the uh, guy who wrote these letters. That's why they're called Peter's. Peter, two uh, believers who have been scattered across uh, Asia Minor. He addresses this letter to them as aliens, meaning their lives stood out. They didn't fit into the surrounding culture of their day. How many of you feel like that's you in the culture that you live in today, that you feel like your life, you don't fit here? It should be that way. This isn't our home. This isn't where we were meant to be. This is our, we're citizens of heaven. And so the culture that we live in, as it gets darker and darker, our light should shine brighter and brighter and uh, be encouraged uh, with that. And uh, we're going to read in Second Peter chapter 2. Are you there yet? All right, before we start, I just want to give a plug because uh, uh, Pastor is sharing about Nicole Hasso, but also Jenny Mead is running for the Urbandale School Board, correct? And I would vouch for her as an as a incredible person, godly person, and a great character. And so we're excited that God is raising up people uh, from our church, our family, uh, to take these offices, and we're praying that that would, that would happen. So 2 Peter chapter 2, we're going to read the first 10 verses. Peter says this, There were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah and he destroyed the world of the ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and those who despise authority. Man, this is not the passage of scripture that I would choose to preach on today, except we're going through these two books of Peter. And here we are at chapter two, and I want to say, man, I wish I had something a lot more uplifting and encouraging to tell you, but can I tell you, my prayer is that at the end of this message, uh, there will be some uplifting response to this. Because I believe that the, the, the culture that he's describing in Second Peter chapter two is the world that we live in. This is the world that we live in. Peter 
is the guy that wrote this, this book. Peter was a guy who uh, made a lot of mistakes. He's the guy who stepped out on the water and walked with Jesus until he took his eyes off Jesus and he, and he sunk. He was the hothead who lopped off the ear of the high priest's servant uh, when they were arresting Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was the guy who denied Jesus three times after that arrest. But he was also the disciple that stood up on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit had been poured out and he preached a sermon and 3,000 people uh, came into the kingdom that day. If you remember, Peter was a fisherman by trade. But Jesus, after Jesus' resurrection, he called Peter to be a shepherd. John chapter 21, after Jesus had been buried, he had been crucified and buried and he was raised to new life, he was resurrected. He appeared to the disciples. In one particular uh, moment, they were, the disciples were out on a boat fishing. They didn't know what to do. They were a little bit discouraged. And uh, so Peter said, look, I'm going to go fishing. They were out on a boat. And Jesus appeared to them. They were so excited that Jesus had, had food on the fire. They came from their boat. They sat around the fire. And Jesus spoke to Peter in that encounter. And three times Jesus said to Peter, or asked Peter the question, Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter responded affirmatively, yes, Lord, I love you. The third time he was just a little bit frustrated. Lord, why do you keep asking me this question? You know everything. You know that I love you. But after each one of those times when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? His response saying, yes, Lord, I love you. What did Jesus say to him? He said, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Feed my sheep. This was the response of a shepherd. Jesus had called him to be a shepherd, to shepherd his people. As a shepherd, you not only have the responsibility of feeding the flock, but also looking out for them, warning them, and protecting them. Paul was speaking to the Ephesian elders in, in Acts chapter 20. And this idea of being a shepherd, he was, he was leaving them. He'd been with them for three years. And he was getting ready to leave. And he said, actually, you, you guys won't see me again in this life. This is, this is going to be the end. And Paul knew that he was coming to an end. And this is what he says, verse 18 of Acts chapter 20. You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. He's saying, look, as a shepherd, I haven't, I haven't shrunk back from telling you the things, not that you wanted to hear, but the things that you needed to hear. How many of you know, even as a parent sometimes, if, if you don't tell your kids the things that they need to know, how are they gonna know that? If you don't tell them the things that they need to hear, the perspective that they need to have, how are they gonna hear that? He goes on to say in verse 26, I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault, for I didn't shrink back from declaring all that God wants you to know. So guard yourselves and God's people. He's, he's commissioning these Ephesian elders. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood. Same thing that Peter was talking about in 2 Peter chapter 2, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elders. I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. So this message of Paul to the Ephesian uh, elders, very similar to the message that Peter is saying to those Christians in 2 Peter chapter 2. So he's speaking as a shepherd. As a shepherd, simply feeding the flock and not protecting or warning them is nothing more than fattening them up for the kill of the enemy. If you're going to feed your flock but never warn them and never protect them, all you're doing is getting them fat and sassy for the enemy to come in and destroy them. Our job, our responsibility as pastors is to teach, to instruct, to inspire, encourage, to equip, to disciple to care for and to love the people that God has entrusted us with. And part of that responsibility is warning about dangers, pitfalls, potential short-sightedness. And this message today, is a, it's a warning. It's not what I would have chosen, but the reality is, is this is important for us to hear. It's important for us to know. 
We have a huge responsibility as, as leaders, as shepherds, and if we're not fulfilling that obligation to feed, to care for, and to warn our flock, then we're doing a huge disservice to each of you individually, to our church as a whole, and to the body of Christ. It's important that we, that we warn. We don't want any of you to be deceived, to be led astray, to, to wander away. We take that responsibility very seriously. It's a matter of eternal life and death that we're talking about and, what, and everything that we do. So this message today is about that very thing. And at the end of the message, I'm gonna give you a, a chance to respond. Because the message today is a, is a warning about false about false teachers, false prophets, it is also a warning about judgment. And it's a reality, it's a, it's a truth. The Bible says that we're all gonna have to give an account to God for our lives. You see, church isn't just a little game that we play and try to see how cool and catchy we are to, to get more people than that other church across town. I think sometimes that's what church has been reduced to. Listen, our, our preaching and teaching has to be more than just uh, behavior modification or psychotherapy. Our sermons can't be little pep talks about the power of positive thinking. What we're looking for is not, not, uh, it's not, it's not behavior modification, but spiritual transformation. And like, Peter, or like Paul said in Acts chapter 20, we won't shrink back from telling you what you need to hear. We're preaching the word of God. Paul said to Timothy, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in chapter two, he's talking about false prophets. But I wanna go back and just recap a little bit of chapter one. Pastor Brian preached an incredible message. If you've missed any of these messages in Peter, they've all been a little bit challenging. So I encourage you, if you missed last week, go back and listen on YouTube. Pull up Pastor Brian's message, a powerful message. But let me just recap chapter one to set up chapter two just a little bit. Verse three says, by God's divine power, he has given us everything that we need to live a godly life. He has given us great and precious promises, and we are to make every effort, verse 5, to receive and to respond to those promises. Verse 10, do these things. Respond to these promises in this way, and you will never fall away. Verse 11, you will actually receive a grand entrance into God's eternal kingdom. Isn't that what we're looking for? This world is not our home. We're not tied to this place. We're looking for an eternal home in heaven with God forever. That should be our goal, our focus, and that's how we take hold of that. Peter says, I'm gonna keep on reminding you of these things that you have been taught so that you will remember them even after I'm gone. We haven't been, he said, we haven't been making up clever stories. We were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. We saw him and we experienced him with our very own eyes. And because of our experience, we have an even greater confidence in the message of the prophets of old. Their words were like a lamp shining in the dark. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, your word is a, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Verse 20 says, realize that those prophets' words weren't their own understanding or initiative. They spoke and they wrote words from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So these are the prophets of old. He's saying, look, it, we believe in that because we've experienced Jesus Christ, who they talked about centuries ago, and we experienced him with our very own eyes, and we're eyewitnesses of this. So listen to us, what we're telling you. Don't forget the words that we're telling you. But then he brings up this idea of false prophets. There were also false prophets in Israel. Just as there will be false teachers among you, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. Listen, false teachers are not gonna show up with, with a sign on their shirt that says, I'm a false teacher. <laughs> They're not gonna say, hey, what I'm gonna tell you is a total lie. It's got a lot of truth in it, but I'm mixing some other stuff in it just to get you confused and distracted because I'm here to divide and conquer. Not gonna tell you that. They're gonna give you a little bit of truth to go with, the, go with their message to try to bring you in. That's the way it works, it's deceptive. We have an enemy and he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. As a faithful shepherd, Peter is warning uh, the, the danger of these false, false teachers, false prophets. Jesus said this in Matthew uh, 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. 
Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Listen, if you knew what I was talking about today, how many of you honestly would have said, yeah, I probably could have just stayed at home rather than coming hearing about false teachers and judgment. But the reality is if we're just feeding you and you're just getting fat and sassy on the word, but you don't ever get a warning, there's never words of caution and protection, what are you? You're just a sitting target for the enemy. If we're just out looking for some, something to tickle our ears, to get a message that makes us feel really good, and then we walk away, what good does it do? If there's an enemy out there, we need to know that he's out there and we need to warn. The disciples asked Jesus um, at, at the end of Matthew chapter 24, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And what was Jesus' response? False messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. There's a sign of the end times. There will be false prophets. People who will come in my name who will deceive. There'll be people who say they're the messiah. Listen, there's all kinds of strange teaching going on. And I gotta tell you, I believe that just that and so many other things that are converging in our time right now, now more than ever, I believe that we're in the end of days. I believe that this world is gonna be coming to an end soon. And I've heard that my whole life, all 54 years of my life, and this has been going on for centuries, people talking about the return of Christ. But I believe now more than ever there are things that are set up and things are changing so drastically and so quickly. Do you feel like you're spinning sometimes when you see what's going on in the world around you? That's a warning. We need to be ready. So this day that we live in, so many conflicting messages, it's been labeled the fake news culture. A vital part of our, our growth and our maturity as Christians hinges on our ability to recognize false teaching and false, false prophets. That's why we tell you to, to bring your Bible, to use your Bible. You look it up. You look it up for yourself. I want you, I, I think you, should, you can trust me, you can trust all the other pastors that are up here, but, but don't just blindly say, you know what, that's what he said. Does it say that in the word? Know for yourself, you've got access to the Bible. It's hard to know what to believe and who to believe in the world that we live in today, but here's what you can believe, this is true. This is the word of God. Can I just tell you the internet is a great source, a great tool to help us, but it's also filled with a lot of garbage. And you've gotta be careful what you listen to, what you read, and what you believe. We've had individuals from this church who were saved in this church, who were discipled in this church, who started reading and educating themselves with stuff that they read on the internet and build a theology that is just plain bizarre. Everything that you read on the internet is not true. Not even everything that you read that says it's Christian. What is the source? Who can you believe? The only way that you'll be able to recognize a false teacher or false teaching is to be knowledgeable in the truth to be well-grounded in scripture. The only way that you would ever spot a fake dollar bill, a counterfeit dollar bill, is to be very familiar with the real deal. How are you gonna be able to know if it's fake or if it's counterfeit if you don't know what the real thing is, what the real thing looks like, what it feels like? And that's what we need to know. Listen, we become the most biblically illiterate generation in American history. I go back to the George Barna report that we, we did a sermon series on biblical worldview back in October. This is alarming. It's alarming that 79% of born again adults believe in the accuracy of the Bible. That's less than four out of five born again believers believe that this book is accurate. Only 46% of born again believers believe in absolute moral truth. 40% of born-again believers believe in the reality of Satan. Majority of born-again believers think he's not real. I don't understand that. Only 62% of born-again believers believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. Where do they get that? There's a reason why we still do Sunday school for all ages here at New Hope. 
Today is the start of a, a new school year, a new, um, brand new quarter for our children's Sunday school. They're actually meeting right now at this 9.30 hour. We have Sunday school for preschool, elementary, middle school, high school during this hour. And we have adult classes, if you didn't know, we have adult classes in eight, the eight o'clock service, 9.30 and 11 o'clock service. So if your kids are here right now and you're just coming to one service, they're probably in kids' church, but this is the time when Sunday school happens. I'm just making a big plug right now. We believe in education. We believe in uh, telling you the truth. We believe in you being in the word and, and having fellowship with other believers and encouraging and spurring each other on. So Sunday school is happening right now. You can have your kids in Sunday school right now while you're in church. And then they can go to Sunday school or they can go to kids' church and you take a class right after this. It's a cool way for it to work. You can pick a class right now and, and attend an 8 o'clock service and you're going, 8 o'clock is way too early. I get it. You're here at 9.30. I'm just saying there's a lot of possibilities and we believe in education, biblical education. So we make that available. We have classes on Wednesday nights for all ages, early childhood, elementary, middle school, high school. We've got a plethora of adult uh, electives. And when this, when this new building gets finished over here, there's going to be so much more space. For the last 25 years, we have put adults on hold so that we can make sure that we have room for children. We have room for, for, um, for youth to be able to meet. And we've thought all along, adults, we can figure this out. We can get together in people's homes. But the reality is, is we want to be able to come together and do that. And when we get this building built, there's going to be all kinds of space. And we've got great plans. We want you to be involved and connected in a group, in a class, so that you're learning and growing. All right, enough for the, enough for the, the PR. We have a growing amount of small groups for adults and families. I encourage you to get plugged in. But here's the deal. All of us have access to the Word of God. Think about what you have compared to Christians in Afghanistan or in China or in some Arab world country where they have a dictator where the Bible is illegal. Listen, we have freedom and we have responsibility to know the word of God. There's no excuse for us. It's a privilege having access to the word of God. Peter said there'll be false teachers among you. They have been, they currently are, and they will be. These false teachers deny Jesus or the master who, who bought them. That language is familiar throughout the New Testament. First Corinthians chapter six, Paul says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. God bought you with a high price, so you must honor him with your body. In 1 Peter 1, Peter addressed this, this same thought. You know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God that bought you and paid for you. These false teachers, these false prophets deny Christ, who he is and what he's done. Do you know there's a growing trend in evangelical Christian world to, to deny the virgin birth of Jesus? There's a lot of people buying into that. It doesn't make sense to our minds, and so we just want to try to, try to you know, check that off and say we don't, we don't believe that. If we don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, then he's lost his deity. He's just another person like you and me. Right? When Peter talks about being bought or ransomed, the picture is that we're slaves of sin. We're slaves to Satan. We've been purchased and our sin has been paid for and we've been made free from sin and we're now free to serve and to glorify Christ. They deny the master who bought them, these false teachers. They don't want a master because a master means that they have someone in authority over them and they're gonna have to submit to somebody else. They despise authority. Verse 19 of 2 Peter chapter 2, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. That's true of any of us. We're a slave to whatever controls our life. If we're not controlled by God, by his word, by the life that he has given us, that he's paid for and set us free by his blood, then what are we being controlled by? 
we have to be so careful that the world doesn't shape us. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world is full of sin and darkness, enslaved to sinful passions, and unless they turn and repent, the world is doomed to judgment. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one says that Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead. Hebrews 9, 27, each person is destined to die once, and after that, face judgment. So Peter warns us of coming judgment, and he uses three examples in verses four to eight. Verse four, he, he gives us the case of fallen angels. God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in the gloomy pits of darkness where they're being held until the day of judgment. Listen, Lucifer and a third of all the angels rebelled against God. They sinned, and he cast them out of heaven. There's a lesson here. The lesson is this happened before. If they despise authority and reject and deny Jesus, they will hear the sentence that Jesus foretold when he said, depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Listen, you don't get by with that. That comes with judgment. There's the case of Noah's generation. God didn't spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. The Bible says of Noah's day, Genesis chapter six, verse five, the Lord saw how wicked the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. It had gotten bad. But there was Noah for 120 years. He built a boat. They didn't have any idea what a boat was for. They thought Noah was probably the, the wackiest whack job out there. Here's this guy building the structure saying, rain's coming, what's rain? A flood's coming, what do you mean a flood? I don't know what that even means. You might as well be speaking a foreign language. They felt so secure. This guy's a whack job. We're not listening to him. Their life just went on and on for 120 years. Until it was time, Noah and his family went into the, into the ark. And like in an instant, water came up from the ground. Water came from the sky and flooded the earth in sh shocking swiftness. There was the case of Sodom and Gomorrah. Later God, verse six, later God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man. He was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness that he saw and heard day after day. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were judged for their depravity, their debauchery, and their immorality. Here's the thing, judgment is coming. All of us are gonna have to give an account of our lives. We're all gonna have to give an account to, to God for what we did and how we lived on this earth. Don't think that you're gonna get out of it. That's the reality, except for the fact that God knows how to rescue his people. Verse nine, you see the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, like Noah and like Lot, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. The Lord knows how to deal with wicked people, and he knows how to rescue and preserve godly people. There's a reason why we need to follow the way, the truth, and the life. The reason why we need to know the truth, because there are, there are false teachers, there's false prophets, there's a, a false way. Not everything that has the label Christian is, is Christian. Do you understand that? You hold us accountable. If we say something wrong, we need to know that. Listen. We want, to, we want to lead all of you in the truth. As, as pastors, as teachers, as leaders in this church, we want to do that. Romans chapter 14, Paul says, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Verse 11, it's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. Yes, each one of us will give a personal account to God. Listen, Peter isn't just saying God knows how to do this. He means that God has done it in the past 
and he will do it again in the future. Judgment is coming, but he will rescue godly people. I'm very thankful for that. So what do we take away as the worship team comes? Three things that I want you to take away. One, the church is not immune to false teachers. We have to make every effort to keep ourselves rooted and grounded in the word of God so that we aren't carried away by the errors of wicked people and lose our sure footing. That's 2 Peter 3, 17. The second thing is this. God's judgment is coming on those who deny Christ. And it would be cruel treatment to let you go about your business and live your lives as though nothing significant were at stake in all of this. But the reality is, is we've got heaven and hell in the balance. I know that everybody wants to go to heaven. And there's some popular theology in in the Christian world today that everybody goes to heaven, that all roads lead to heaven. But I'm gonna tell you, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. If I tell you any, or anybody else tells you anything else, it's false. Jesus is the only way. He's not one way among many ways. The third thing is is that you can be saved from judgment if you repent, if you trust the master who bought you with his blood. Jesus paid a high price for your salvation. He died on a cross in your place. He took your punishment upon himself so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be free. It doesn't make any sense, but the reality is he stepped in and he took your place. He died for you so that you could live for him and so that you could live forever in heaven with him. It's a free gift. Listen, the Bible says it's by grace that we're saved through faith. It's not anything that we can do for ourselves. It's a free gift from God. Nothing that we can do, it's not by work so that none of us can boast except to boast in the fact that Jesus is our savior and he died and he took my place and I've let him be Lord of my life. How many of you sitting here today would say, Pastor Jeff, in my heart today, I know now more than ever I need God. I need a relationship with Jesus. Without that, listen to me. There will be a a day of reckoning. There will be a judgment. Without Christ, you can't make it. He's not just your ticket to heaven, but he is the way to really experience life the way it was meant to be experienced. There's a lot of deception and a lot of people trying to think that this this is the way that makes sense. But there's a way that, that seems right to a man and the end leads to destruction. Jesus Christ is the only way. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here in the room or you're joining us online today and you're not in a relationship with Jesus, you're not walking with Jesus, you're not in the word, you're not following after him, you'd say really the reality is is I'm kind of doing my own thing. God is just something I do once in a while. But he's not really, if I just really evaluate my life, he's not really Lord of my life. He's just something that I do once in a while. And today you would say, I don't want to be in that place. I want to be in a place where I know that my life is secure, that my life is safe, that my life is found in Jesus. And you need him to save you today, to forgive you of your sins and give you new life. With every head bowed and eye closed, you'd say, Pastor Jeff, He's speaking to me today, and I need to give my life to him. Maybe you've walked with him, and you just have, been, have fallen away. Or maybe you've never made that decision. With every head bowed, I'm looking around. If that's you, just raise your hand and keep it raised. Don't miss the opportunity. Do you know for certain that if your life were to come to an end right now, what would happen with your life if you're not? make the choice, the decision for Jesus. Father, right now I pray for any person that is feeling that sense of conviction in their heart. They know they're not right with you. They know that they are not walking in your forgiveness and in your love and your mercy and your grace. Today, we say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive all my sins. Change my heart. Change my life. Put my life on that path that leads to you. And I will pursue you with all of my heart. 
Thank you, Jesus, for taking my place and making a way for me. Save me. Forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that choice today, tell somebody. If you made that choice today and you're joining us online, get in contact with us. You can email me, jeff at newhope.church, and uh, we want to come alongside you, help any of you in this pursuit of Jesus following him, a Christian walk, a Christian life. Here's the deal. I want to ask you to respond today. If you'll stand, those that are in the room, and you would say, I need to make a new commitment to following Jesus. If everybody would just stand up, I didn't make that very clear. Some of you are standing, you didn't even know what you're standing for. I'm standing. I'm just standing for Jesus. I think we all ought to always be on point to say, anytime I can take a stand for Jesus, I'm going to stand for Jesus. Listen, why would we stand for anything else? We'll stand for the Republican Party. We'll stand for the United States of America. And we don't stand for Jesus? Who cares about the United States of America if we don't have Jesus? What is the most important thing in our life? Listen, today, if you're not committed to saying, I'm going to be a person of the word, and I'm going to live this out, not just, not just go to church on Sunday. Listen, that's just something to do. If we're coming to church and nothing else is going on in our life spiritually, what's the point? You're just wasting your time. You could be doing something else today. Go to the fair. I don't know where that came from. I pray that's not just Jeff Hill, but I really feel like the Holy Spirit is saying to us, get right, live right. The world is coming to an end, people. It's not going to be this. 20 years ago, I was telling teenagers as a youth pastor, it's not going to be like this in our lifetime. It's going to change in our lifetime. What we're experiencing in life right now isn't going to be this way forever. I was saying that 20 years ago, and I didn't even know what I was saying. Listen, it's not the same today as it was 20 years ago, and it's not going to be the same a year from now. Things are changing in our world, and if we're not right with Jesus, we're going to get left. And who is going to save you then? Get right, live right with Jesus. I could have just preached that three minutes and saved your time. We're going to end with a song. And if you want to make a commitment today and you're making a commitment to say, yes, I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm going to take this opportunity to do so. You just come at the front and you say, I'm standing right now. It's easy to stand here. If we can't stand here, where can we stand? God's going to give you opportunity to stand this week. What are you going to do? Amen. Stand for truth. Righteousness. Godliness holiness. Be used of God. Bless you guys. Have a great week.